I so enjoy listening and praying with Amy and Carl, our Shacharit service. And this service is called Yismechu, Rejoicing. And I feel a certain tension as I just presented that middle paragraph of the Shema. Because that middle paragraph of the Shema, I could feel my rising fear and anger of a world in which climate change is wreaking havoc, in which COVID is wreaking havoc, in which the failure to respond collectively with an eye towards science and collective effort is leading to worse crises, only becoming worse crises. In our Torah reading, and I said that middle paragraph comes from our Torah reading, we have Moses who would have a difficult time as a rabbi in many a congregation. You know, too many people think that rabbi should only be sweet, say nice things, don't be controversial, rabbi. People come, they want to relax and feel the goodness. But that's not Moses' tone in Vahayaim Shamoa, as you could hear the threat of stopping up the heavens. Because ultimately the responsibility of a of a moral leader, of a Moshe, and of a rabbi, is to talk hard truths. And in this morning's Torah reading of Parshat Akev, Moses is standing before the people of Israel, knowing that he will not enter into the promised land with them, and he speaks hard truths. In fact, in Parshat Akev, you got a taste of it in that middle paragraph, you have reflected Moses' greatest fear for the people. His greatest fear that will be described in a moment is that when the people come into the promised land, they will prosper. For it is a good land that God gives to them. But they will forget God's role in giving the land. They will grow arrogant. And so, that is Moses' greatest fear. Forgetfulness leading to arrogance. Some famous lines, but these are lines you may not know in context. You know the famous line, man does not live by bread alone. Well, that is Moses' words in our Torah reading on behalf of God. It's chapter 8, verse 3. God subjected you, he teaches, to the hardship of hunger and then gave you manna to eat, which neither you nor your fathers had ever known, in order to teach you that a person does not live on bread alone, but that a person may live on anything that the Lord decrees. In its original context, man does not live by bread alone, is to say, yes, you can read that verse as saying you need more than just food. You need relationships, you need culture, you need music. But in its context, what Moses is teaching is, again, the beginning of the verse, he subjected you to the hardship of hunger and then gave you manna to eat, to teach that God wrought a miracle for you in the desert. That it wasn't bread that sustained you, it was God that sustained you. That you can live on more than bread, you can live on manna. And that image is the image that will carry through this Parsha, which is do not forget how you were dependent on God. And so, When the harvest come, just seven verses later, Va'achalta v'savata uvarachta, and when you have eaten your fill, give thanks at Adonai Elohecha to the Lord your God, al ha'aretz hatova asher natanlach, to the God who gave you this good land, circle the word, who gave you. For as Moses will warn, you might 
think that you got this land because of your merit. You might think you got this land because you fought and defeated those seven nations. Know that this land is a gift to you. The rabbis will understand Uverachta, and you shall bless as the command at the end of every meal to do Birkat Hamazon, grace after meals. Moses is afraid for the people. He shamer lecha, the next words. Guard yourself, pen tishkach, lest you forget, et Adonai Lohecha, the Lord your God. And fail to keep God's commandments, God's rules, God's laws, and I enjoin you, which I enjoin you to this day. When you have eaten your fill and have built fine houses to live in, and your herds and flocks have multiplied, and your silver and gold have increased, and everything you own has prospered, beware, lest your heart grow haughty, and you forget the Lord your God who freed you from the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. And so Moses' greatest fear, it's at the center of this Parsha today and it's throughout. And you can feel the tension. It's not all sweet. This is Moses because life isn't all sweet. Life is sweet and yet life has dangers that if ignored can lead to disaster. And Moses' fear is that when the people go to the land, a good land, and they prosper, they will forget. They will fail to remember their dependency on God and, if you will, their dependency on each other. If it's good for me, that's the only test. Wrong, Moses says. Vahaya im shamoa in the plural. It's only if you obey these commandments collectively will you prosper. And so Moses has an antidote. And Moses' antidote is to learn to be grateful. That when you sit and you eat your meal, a gathering of the harvest, that you know that you are dependent on the rain and on the sun and those who went before you and those all around you for the harvest. And before you take that piece of bread and put it in your mouth, you are called to pause. For in that pause is perspective. In that pause is gratitude. In that pause is the awareness that what you eat, although you've worked for it, is not just because of you. What you have worked for is a gift to be savored. The rabbis will teach later in the Talmud that to eat a piece of bread and not to express gratitude is to be a thief. To act as if it is yours for the taking. And so Moses in our Torah reading has an edge. It is not all sweet. It is a warning that you are given much, but it's your responsibility to live up to it or to fail to remember is to lead toward disaster. My greatest fear for the Jewish people is superficiality. It's a kind of forgetfulness that there is subtlety in our legacy. It's too easily dismissed. And with that, it's not just the rituals that are too easily dismissed. Why should I keep kosher? That's when they didn't have the FDA. Superficiality is what I'm afraid of. So two little pieces. Pickles with Seth Rogen. I watched it with Linda. It's supposed to be very Jewish and a comedy. And when I got to the end of Pickles, what I felt profoundly was sad. For Seth Rogen and others who are basically comedy writers in terms of their career, in a deeply Jewish film in terms of a great-grandfather who came from the shtetl, who survived a hundred years in a pickle brine and was revived to meet his great-grandson, a young Jew of the same age as him living in Brooklyn, 
is the superficiality of the life of the great-grandson in Brooklyn. Not only superficial in terms of a lack of relationships with others that have deep significance, but a sense of simply being spoiled in the world. And last, and this is the part that saddened me, the sense that Judaism is simply old world Bubba Misa, the tales of grandmothers that are out of touch with the higher ethics of the world in which we live. And there are certain, for me, which is why I am a conservative rabbi, evolving awarenesses of needing to treat women as equal to men, of needing to accept LGBTQ as in the image of God and having the same rights of marriage and love as anybody else. I do see that as positive, but the dismissal by superficial caricature of Judaism left me profoundly pained. That's my fear. My fear is ignorance, that Jews today learn Judaism as a child and think that that is the faith. So Seth Rogen can say in an interview from Phoenix, no, from L.A., he can say, I was misled as a child about Israel. I didn't know there was another people there. Well, that's true when children learn. We don't learn as children about the challenges of American Indians. What we do learn at its best, at its best, is the values of the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. It is sad that America had an ugly beginning that still continues in terms of certain minorities and not just with American Indians. But that doesn't define America. And for Seth Rogen cavalierly to dismiss Israel for his failure in as a child in summer camp not to learn of the political complexities is a quality of superficiality that bothers me in my deepest core because Judaism to me matters as a wisdom tradition, as a challenge, not as just sweet, but as bittersweet, which is the chalk that I like to eat. Because life is ultimately more complex in its flavors. Plain white bread just doesn't cut it as the only bread. And so, two thoughts, because any teaching should end on a happy note. The first, which is the transition, is to honor, as I did last night, Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz, the great illuminary teacher of our generation, of our millennia, who passed away yesterday. Adin Steinsaltz said, let them know. It's not enough to know the taste of matzo balls. It's not enough to only gather for Pesach Seder as your Jewish identity. That is the beginning of freedom, but that's not content that gives one a moral center, a challenge, a sense that you have to take into account the stranger and the widow and the orphan, and that unless you are aware of your responsibilities to care for the planet, it's going to burn up. I said I was going to try to end on a happier note. And that is to say that Adin Steinsaltz, for 45 years, dedicated himself to translating the Talmud, that huge corpus, 63 volumes of the conversations of our sages as to how to live a Jewish life. What are those moral teachings? It spans five, six centuries of discussion. But what is remarkable about the Talmud is that if you open a page of Talmud, all around it are commentaries. Those commentaries are there to say that the conversation did not stop in Jerusalem, nor in Baghdad. That conversation continues medor lador from generation to generation, starting with the Torah. What does it mean to have a God who created the world, who's the parent, therefore, of all peoples? What are our responsibilities before God and on behalf of God? And so, 
Let my people know was the life work of Adin Steins also on this Shabbat. We both feel the sadness of an illuminary's passing, a little less light in the world, but also gratitude. Gratitude that we live in a time and place where his writings could be disseminated immediately. All of his writings are online in terms of the translation of the Talmud. Safaria, a website worth knowing about, has posted Adin Steinsaltz's translation for free. Wow, to live in a time with access at the right price to that kind of legacy is the gift of our time. And I'll also add, 30 years ago, Adin Steinsaltz was on the cusp of death, just having begun that project. And because of modern medicine, because of scientists, he was able to overcome that illness and to survive to die now at the age of 83, sadly for the last four years of his life, post-stroke, to be without the ability to speak. But to have lived a long and fruitful life because of medicine, enabling him to give us the opportunity to let my people know. And so a closing image of rejoicing. In this space on Thursday, just a couple days ago, seven individuals sat here on the bima and each read a statement that they had composed. Those seven individuals came before Rabbi Shalom Podwal, Rabbi Robin Foomberg, and myself as a Beit Din, as a court, gatekeepers for the Jewish people our responsibility to determine if an individual asking to join our people was making that decision free-willed, informed as a lifelong commitment. And so we asked them to write even before our conversation would begin a statement as to why they wish to be a Jew. We had a box of tissues there next to them and it was used by several of the individuals as they were reading what they had already wrote about their own spiritual journey that had led them to coming before us and saying, I have studied Judaism. Our course was 18 sessions, 36 hours, but it required more preparation and reading and with Helene Coulter's volunteering the opportunity to learn Hebrew reading as well. Akwam, Ahmed, chose the name Moshe. Sinise Haskins chose the name Simcha. Rochelle Selen chose the name Rachel. Yenli Zingali chose the name Ziva. Dorothy Wilhelm chose the name Hannah. Sean Rielzel chose the name Shmuel and Malcolm Crawford chose the name Yochanan. And what they shared with their own stories, with their own nuance, was that they had found in Judaism a community of tradition, of rituals that enhanced their life. But they had found through their study was a quality of wisdom and moral calling that for each of them was a way to live life more fully, more alive. What they each shared is that when they have been on Shabbat tables, they have found it indeed a harvest worthy of gratitude, of celebration, of a pause of the week to be with people you love and to feel the goodness of life. To become a Jew as an adult requires going beyond the superficial. It requires study. It allows the asking of questions that children would not necessarily ask and take in information on a level of nuance that the children in our religious school who get a beautiful education are not yet intellectually prepared to absorb. 
Candidate after candidate on Thursday spoke about how they are growing in Shabbat observance. Candidate after candidate spoke about how keeping kosher matters to them, even if they're not fully there, as worthy of their attention and aspiration. Candidate after candidate spoke about the moral imperatives of tikkun olam, of repairing the world that defines the substance of belonging to a people that is not only a tribe, but it's much more. It's a people that sees itself representing a universal God who sees a calling to be holy, to be able to reflect God's light and God's love in the larger world. We as a people exist for a purpose. That is Moses' teaching in Akev. Vahaya. Akev tishma'un et hamishpatim. And it will be after Akev that you observe my ways. And the rabbis emphasize that the word Akev, like the word Yaakov, means heal. If you do not trample, the rabbis will comment on my laws. But pause and look to where you walk. And know that you walk alongside of me and I care about how you act on behalf of my people of Israel and more. My people Israel must care for the whole of creation. Our Haftorah this morning, chapter 49 of Isaiah, are words of comfort in which Isaiah, speaking to a dispersed people, says, you are like a bride to God. Yes, there have been tensions between you, but God longs for you as a groom does for a bride. You are beloved. Ribbono Shalallah, master of the universe. What a privilege we each have as Jews to see ourselves across generations from our Torah reading, whether born as Jews or as those seven remarkable people this week, choosing to be adopted into the Jewish people, may each one of them know that they are fully a member of this extended family, making no difference as the love of a family, whether you were born into it or you were adopted. Each one is equal. Each one is called. Each one is the child of Abraham and Sarah and is yours to be accountable to, for they, each of them, will bring the richness of their own lives to us as a people fully, not leaving behind, but bringing with and growing, for we all know we are as shaped by where we see ourselves going and the values that we hold than where we come from. May they each grow in their Judaism, and may we who are part of this Jewish community now know that what we receive is a gift, whether it's the food that we eat or the breath we bring in, each is the gift of life. May we not live with hubris. May we celebrate what we have as a collective gift and may we be gift givers Amen.